for yeah we can wait a little longer it's fine i i prepared for 55 minutes so So is Carl Cohen still at Purdue? Who? Oh, no. Uh, uh, no. Uh, no. Cohen, no, no. He uh, at some point became a dean at IUPAI in Indianapolis. Mm. And then uh, he uh, didn't do well as a dean, uh, but he still uh, uh, was a professor. I'm not sure. He, he may be retired now, but, uh -huh. okay. but he is at uh, IUPAI. Okay, so maybe we should start. Okay, uh, yes. so yeah, I'll mute myself. Uh, very happy to have a very distinguished speaker today, Jesus Delera from uh, University of California in Davis. He's one of the world's experts on polytopes, and he's going to tell us uh, something new about polytopes uh, connected with linear programming and simplex method today. Um, so Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's, it's great to see some old friends. And uh, I, I think I was last. In, I was in Purdue physically in uh, 1998 or 1999, probably. So anyway, uh, it's good to see you at least. In, in, in this this work, I'm going to present is joint work. It's two papers, and it's joint work. Uh, uh, the main part of the of the talk is joint work with uh, my PhD student Alex Black. Uh, Raman Sanyal, who's at the University of Frankfurt, and Niklas Ludgerhams, who's also at the University of Frankfurt in Germany. And then I, I will mention a, one other paper that uh, we just posted by, with Alex, uh, Sean Kafer at the University of Waterloo, and Lara Sanita, who's in TU and Do Eindhoven. So this, this is stories about a very famous algorithm in optimization that actually we don't understand it i mean there's a lot of very very nice questions about the simplex method that we don't know the answer for so what but let me start from the beginning just quickly so i understand the problem so the the problem we're interested in is we have a system of linear inequalities or equations you can add equations if you wish it doesn't it doesn't affect um and you want to want you want to maximize or minimize a linear function constraint on the solutions that the solutions have to satisfy these linear inequalities, right? And uh, for computer science reasons, I mostly will talk about the case where you have uh, the, the input data that describes this, this subject is uh, rational, all rational numbers, okay? So as you, as you know, this is the set of possible solutions of this uh, problem uh, is a polyhedron, a convex polyhedron. And that's going to be, be, play a very important role. In my talk, I will assume that it's actually a polytope. So that means that this is, in fact, bounded. It's not unbounded, OK? I'm going to assume that. Um, and, and what I want to talk about is the simplex method. It was invented in 1947 and is one of the most influential algorithms in optimization. Uh, for example, if we didn't have the simplex method today, probably a lot of things will not exist. I mean, there's a lot of, for example, the duality of linear programming was develop a lot of understand, understanding the simplex method. And uh, I mean, many, many, many things we do today depend on simplex method, still very popular. And uh, anyway, the algorithm that we, we're going to talk about can be described for a geometry talk very quickly. So let me do that. So the simplex method, <laughs> Uh, again, I'm skipping a lot of the numerical linear algebra and the uh, very important and, and management of, of matrices and all that. But the ideas in geometry are very simple. So you have a convex region, a, a convex polyhedral region. And what we know is that if there is an optimal solution, one of the optimal solutions has to be a vertex, OK? So, so what we do is we start at, at some vertex, so maybe this one. And if there is uh, a, an objective function, so in this example, my objective function is maybe pointing in this way. This is the, the objective function I want to optimize. Um, I would like to orient the graph. So I, I direct the graph with this uh, objective function. And then I, I can see whether an edge uh, improves the objective function value. For example, here in this point, I can improve by going in this direction, right? So I can improve. And so if I do that, I can move to the next vertex. So I can move to the next vertex. 
by choosing one of the improving edges. And remember, there might be a choice, right? So for example, here, there's a choice of two possible edges that can improve and so on. So I, I repeat this process. Now I'm in a new vertex. And again, I need to have a decision. What's the best? If there is an improving edge, I pick the best according with some criterion. Uh, this is a very important part of my talk. So, that, But I will talk more about that. The criterions are called pivot rules. So, so the pivot rule is what you use to choose what edge to select in the next iteration. right? And uh, so you keep doing this until you cannot improve anymore. So let's see, I think uh, there you are. So I think the last, the that, there you are, you cannot improve anymore. There's no edge that improves. And that means that you can prove at that point that you are at an optimal solution. So that's in a nutshell, the algorithm. And again, I'm skipping a lot of details. For example, another detail that I'm skipping is, um, you know, as you can see in this polytop, the, this, um, this vertex, for example, has four facets, four, four, four facets that come together and define, four hyperplanes that come together and define that, that vertex, that zero dimensional phase. Um, now that's a degenerate polyhedron. That will be a, in, in, in the terminology of applied mathematics, this will be a degenerate uh, linear program. And that's not very good. So, but in practice, people deal with this. I mean, there are ways to deal with the degeneracy, okay? Are you with me so far? This is a brief one minute introduction to the simplex method. And of course, I'm gonna ask a question about the simplex methods. And the question is, uh, ah, okay, for, no, for a little bit more background, sorry. I, I, I already, uh, because I'm gonna use this a little bit. So when you have an objective function and you have the polyhedron, you actually have a directed graph. So for a geometric, from a geometric point of view, a polyhedron, is, uh, sorry, a linear program. What is a linear optimization problem? Is just a polyhedron with an orientation of the edges. You have a directed graph on the edges of the graph, okay? So uh, I'm in the real algebraic geometry and optimization seminar. So I would like to call your attention to one fascinating question. So you can give me an orientation that has no cycles. That, so it's a cyclic and that every phase has a unique sink and a unique source. And you can ask, is this orientation coming from a linear function, right? So because in this example that I'm giving you, the linear function goes in this direction, right? And uh, so you can ask, okay, this, this orientation was produced by some linear function, but maybe I have some clever way to, uh, to try to fool you, right? It's a, it's a realization question. So what orienta which orientations uh, of, the, of the graph of the polytop are actually achievable by linear, th these are linear, linearly realizable orientations, you see? And um, we don't know, this is, a, this is essentially a, a semi-algebraic problem, very interesting semi-algebraic problem. I can tell you more later if you're interested. Uh, anyway, so the, the question that I want to decide today is the choice of the pivot rule. The pivot rule, for me, at the moment at least, is, is a method for selecting the improving edge at every vertex. So when you are standing here, which one should I choose, this one or this one? There has to be some criterion, some rule, some methodology or algorithm that will tell you that, okay? This, yeah. Okay, so the big question of this talk, and I hope the question is clear, uh, it's a long, long-standing open question in the theory of computer science. Is there a, a choice of pivot rule for the simplex algorithm that makes it into a polynomial time algorithm? That's the question. Okay. So the answer is we don't know yet. Uh, a lot of uh, I will tell you briefly about the evidence uh, as quickly as possible of the evidence we have today. Some summary of that. But are there, are there any questions about the question and the simplex method? Just before I move on. Yeah. By the way, feel free to interrupt me. This is a small audience. I'd rather that you ask questions and you feel free to interact with me. If, if I don't finish everything, it's okay, but... Uh... Okay, so, so far the, the simplex method pivot rules behave badly. In 1972, Klee, Klee and Minty, so here's Victor Klee, my academic grandfather, and here's George Minty. Uh, they, they found a beautiful construction. They constructed a linear programming problem called the Klee-Minty cube. Well, nowadays we call it the Klee-Minty cube because it's a combinatorial cube that has the property that for, for a very famous pivot rule, uh, the, this is the pivot rule that Danzig invented for the first time in 1947. 
the dancing pure rule takes an exponential number of steps. So it starts at this, at this uh, origin of the cube, let's say. I mean, it's not the origin per se. And the coordinates are complicated, by the way. The coordinates of these hyperplanes, as you can see, the hyperplanes are kind of tilted, right? So you can see one of the hyperplanes here. It's kind of tilted. And uh, it's, a, it's a deformed cube. It's combinatorially a cube but it's not, uh, it's not uh, regular at all, right? Mm -hmm. Anyway, so this, this uh, objective function just goes, uh, just goes up in this, in this example. And the problem is that the, 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 the pivot rule is gonna select this, this walk, which is an increasing walk. It's, it's, a, it's a perfectly fine monotone increasing walk, uh, optimizing the way I described to you in the simplex method. It's legal, but it takes exponentially many steps. But as you can see in just one step, in just one step, I can finish everything, right? So that's a little bit bad. <laughs> um, yeah. So and and some people say, well, you know, Jesus, that's that's not a, that's not a big deal because it's probably because of the big numbers, and that is not true because you can find um, you know network that when you can define as you know linear programming is very strongly related to max flow mean code problems. I mean network flow problems, and in networks the network simplex algorithm. Uh, also has bad behavior. So that was demonstrated a year later by Sade. He found a very nice construction of a network simplex problem. So it's a, in a particular network and the, the dancing pivot rule takes exponentially many steps. And there the matrix, the constraints of the matrix are very nice. I mean, they're just zeros and ones. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, are you with me so far? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's, that's the, the, the bad news. And the problem is that the bad news have continued. So essentially today, 2022, we don't know a pivot rule that, that even comes close to be polynomial. Uh, um, so, and there are so many pivot rules. I can probably spend two days just talking about each pivot rule if I, if I don't wanna do that. I'm gonna mention a few important pivot rules for my talk, but essentially, essentially there's one pivot rule per person in the planet. I mean, there's many, many pivot rules. <laughs> and, uh, so I will mention a few. I already mentioned that very briefly, Danzig pivot rule, which was or historically one of the first pivot rules uh, created. But in my talk, I would like to, to highlight a few other pivot rules. For example, um, steepest edge pivot rule is the most popular in practice. So if you buy software, if you buy Gurovi, Cplex, any commercial software, you can be sure that they are using a steepest edge rule pretty much at the beginning of every computation because it's, it's in practice is very, very good. It's really very good. And, um, uh, you know, that's, that's what, okay, but let's, let me explain some of these con concepts. So the greatest improvement rule is the simplest to explain because that's the greedy. You, you, you start, you are at the vertex and you choose all, of, of all the possible edges that, that improve, you choose the one that maximizes the most. You're just very greedy. You just go greedily. Okay, so that's, that would be great improvement. Now, a steepest edge is kind of a variation of that idea because what you do is um, you, you choose the edge that maximizes, but you consider the length of the edge itself. So you divide by the length of the edge and you can use, people use the L2 norm, but you can use any L, LP norm. For example, we use the L1 norm sometimes in, in, my, in our papers. And, uh, and so that that's a pretty 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 very good it's a very good rule so it's very very efficient it's, it's very simple to implement so it's very popular I mentioned already that there are degenerate polytopes and, and it, the danger in degenerate polytopes is that you can actually have uh, cycling that you can get stuck you don't move you, you don't move just stay in the same vertex because there are so many representations of the same vertex right for example, if the vertex is like this, that there are five planes that come into that vertex, there are so many ways to represent the same, the same, the same point, the same optimal point, that you might end up just circling around the same point. And and Bland, uh, there's a, a a combinatorial rule called Bland's pivot rule, that essentially by choosing always the the the, the least lexicographic uh, plane that that needs to leave the the, the basis you actually go to, you, you finish. You, you don't get stuck in, in degeneracies. You, you, you don't have cycling, all right? 
Okay, so just uh, uh, I want to talk about the the random random edge pivot rule is really good. I mean, you have a, mo a bunch of of the uh, pivot rule uh, pivot uh, possibilities. So how, which one do you choose? You you choose one at random. You just flip a coin and you choose one at random. This may sound really stupid to you, but it's actually very good. Uh, I mean, at least theoretically, it's very good. Um, I mean, in what sense? For uh, for many for many years, it was one of the most popular pivot rules for theory proving theorems. And some people had um, uh, essentially proof, not totally exponential bounds, but they, they had constructed um, uh, upper bounds that are, uh, uh, what is it called? I mean, it's, I'll, I'll show you the bounds in a moment, but it's, it's uh, quasi exponential bounds, essentially. Or quasi, so some people call them, uh, with, because you have a logarithm in the exponent, essentially, not, not, not just a, you know, n to the d, but you have n to the log d or something like that. Okay. Jesus, can I ask a question? Sure, sure, sure. So I got confused. So how can you have a cycling if you have a monoton path that you are improving at every step? Yeah, of course. Let's go back to my picture, actually. Um, because, so it has to do, my, I think the issue here, it has to do with my, um, uh, I was keeping all the linear algebra, right? So remember that, how do we keep a vertex in memory in the computer? Essentially, we describe it by selecting the three hyperplanes that define that vertex. For example, this hyperplane, this hyperplane, this hyperplane, they define that vertex, right? The intersection of this hyperplane. So that's that's a basis. But then there's another choice, right? I could have chosen this hyperplane, this hyperplane, this hyperplane. And uh, when you do the numerical criteria, when you're just looking at the pure numerical criteria, you might jump. Mm -hmm. from one plane. So you substitute a plane by another plane of the same vertex, essentially. And that's the creation of, uh, of, of cycles. So essentially, you spend a bunch of iterations just in the same vertex without actually improving, right? So this is a very interesting distinction because some iterations of the simplex method might be essentially, you're stuck at a, at a place. You're not making, you're not making advances. Now, if you pick a pick a polytope that is not degenerate, like take a cube, for example, that, that's not a degenerate polytope because there's essentially just one combination of planes that define every vertex, right? Yeah, like this cube here, this this point is uniquely defined by this plane, this plane, this plane. So, so then then there's an identity, a, a unique. If you switch a plane, you really are switching a vertex, so you you don't have a, that problem. So what people do in practice is they perturb the data, right? They use a perturbation of the data. They use some random noise or some ran clever perturbation, and then they have a, a generic polytope, and then it's, there's no issue with, with cycling either, right? But if you want to just guarantee that you're not gonna get stuck in the original representation, that's you need you need something like Bland's rule. Mm -hmm. is, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now let, let's see. Uh, okay. So one one more. So. I already told you that uh, Sade was working on this problem. So he, he constructed also a, a, a pivot rule that is very interesting because it takes into account what planes you have been using to represent the vertices so far, right? And this is the, the, the so-called, uh, uh, you, you look, consider what is the, 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 the hyperplane that has entered the least on the basis that has been present the least times. And that's the one you pick over all the others. So that's, that's kind of the idea. Okay, are there any questions of all these pure rules? I'm going to highlight one very important pure rule that connects to algebraic geometry that contains to many other topics. But I want to stop here. If you have any questions of these other pure rules or the, the, the questions of what, where we stand today. No? Okay. So I'm going to define another pure rule that is, uh, was invented in the 19... I guess if this go ba goes back at least to the 1980s to the work of uh, Borbart. Uh, so, so the, this, this pivot rule is very beautiful and it's, it's uh, very attractive to geometers and, and it connects to toric varieties, it connects to all kinds of topics in algebraic geometry. So I think uh, this seminar people, you, you guys will like it, I think. Okay, so the shadow vertex pivot rule goes as follows. So you originally, you, you give me an LP, a linear program. So I want, I have, this is my objective function I want to optimize. Here's my polytope, I get an orientation, right? I get an orientation of the graph of the polytope. Now, I pick another objective function, okay? I pick another objective function in such a way that if this is the, this is the vertex I'm standing, right? This is the vertex I'm currently standing. 
Um, I do a projection of the polytope down to a shadow. So, so this, this is essentially, I construct a, a, two uh, a map from P, from P to R2, right? And the map goes as follows. I just pick the, the projection by these two linear functions, right? That, and I get a shadow. So what you see here in this picture is if I pick, uh, you know, there's essentially, if I pick the right objective function, I will see this quadrilateral, right? This is essentially looking at the, at the, at the shape of this quadrilateral. I guess if, if my objective function psi is going outside the, the slide, I will get that effect, right? Are you with me? So now what's the advantage you will say? Well, okay, here is the, here's how you do it. You, your vertex became one of, a vertex of this polygon. Now you got a polygon on the plane, right? So the, your polytope became a polygon of some kind. In this case, in this example, the polygon is a quadrilateral. And what I do is I essentially follow the top of the of this pol polygon. So I just consider one, or, you know, one of the. I just consistently follow one of the two the two paths, and that's the path I follow to the optimal because the the optimal solution has to be also a vertex of this polygon. I mean, of course, some of the vertices disappear; they go into the interior, right? So maybe this vertex goes into the interior. So they don't they don't play a role if you don't do, don't do a projection that is very generic. But um, now I'm of course simplifying the idea because you need to know how to do this not by doing the projection. Doing the projection will be too expensive, right? The computing the projection of a polytope, of the shadow, the computing the shadow of a semi-algebraic set is too expensive in general. So what I would like to do is just do it on top of the of you know in the original data, and I can I know how to do that essentially by just looking at the slope of the, essentially the ratio between the two objective functions. I will give you a formula in a moment. Uh, are you with me of the idea of this uh, algorithm of this pivot rule? I just pick the one that gives me uh, the, the edge. Essentially, I have an edge that corresponds to the to the to the top path, and I follow those edges on top on the original polytope, right? So that's those are the edges that I follow. Are you with me? Yeah. Now this 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 uh, this pivot rule generates a special types of of monotone paths, of, of, of improving paths on this directed graph. And I will call them coherent. And I, I think already my friend Andre is gonna start thinking, ah, oh, I think where he's going because coherent is something that we use in the 1990s to understand you know, secondary polytopes, regular triangulations and things like that. So yeah, coherent are the paths that you select by using, essentially you generate by se selecting these two objective functions, okay? Now, the bad news is that even for this beautiful construction, even the, for this beautiful pivot rule, there are exponentially long shadows. That means that in, the bad, in a bad situation, if you don't project in a clever way, or if you don't project, uh, if you're unlucky, the projection will take you to exponentially many steps. I mean, there are many examples um, where this happens. And even in zero one polytopes, right? Even, even in the, you may say, oh, zero one polytopes with vertices over zero one are gonna be nice, but that's not true. Okay, this is the shadow vertex pivot rule. Now, as I mentioned, uh, in the 1990s, we studied these objects. So this is this goes back to the work of uh, Bilera, uh, Kapranov, Stulfels. I mean, the, the 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 first paper appeared in in 1990. Then there was a, this. I think the first paper of of these three people was in 1992. This is maybe when I met Andrei Gavrilov in Cornell. I, I don't. I'm not sure, but maybe it's around that time. And uh, uh, yeah, so so this the, the fact is it's an incredibly beautiful fact. There's a polytope. There's a polytope that the vertices of this polytope are in bijection to the coherent monotone paths that you can have on on the uh, on on a polytope. So you start with a polytope. In 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 this example, I have the cube. So my polytope P is the cube, and now I look at the and I, I look at the objective function C, so I want to minimize, you know, minimize C transpose over 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 P, and uh, and now I look at all the possible choices of the second objective function, and that they are going to generate some paths, right? They're going to generate some paths, and the the paths it generates are so very beautifully structured. They form a polytope. In this example, the cube, the the three dimensional cube, the monotone path, the coherent monotone paths correspond to the uh, 
to the vertices of a hexagon. But if you do it for the n-dimensional cube, you're going to get a permutahedron. So people that like combinatorics, you recognize this is a permutahedron. So that this is always true. There's always some, some high dimensional polytope. In fact, the dimension of this polytope is going to be uh, dimension of p minus one. And this is called the, so Villera, Caprano, Caprano, and Stunfer called this the monotone path polytope. So I'm going to just say monotone path polytope. That's what they call it. Are you with me so far? So I so the reason I'm showing you this theorem from the 1990s is not just because my friend Andre is here, but because uh, it's going to be relevant later to what I'm going to present to you. Okay. Okay. So I don't want to give you just bad news. I want to tell you some good news, and this has to do with um, uh, some some results that uh, where stochastic analysis. So pivot rules uh, gives you very nice, very nice analysis. So sometimes the stochastic analysis of algorithms is definitely better than the deterministic analysis, right? So in the 90, so Borbart introduced the, the, um, the shadow vertex pivot rule and he introduced it to prove that in expected polynomial time, uh, the expected number of iterations for, 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 a, for a linear program using the, the shadow vertex, is, uh, is polynomial if you use, uh, if you sample from a fixed distribution. So he was sampling the polytops, the constraints of these polytops come from a specific uh, probability distribution of the constraints. So remember my polytope is given by some inequalities, A is less than equal to B, that's my polyhedron. So the sampling of the matrix A is done in a, you know, some, some kind of, um, yeah, the, the, it's a very central, centrally symmetric uh, distribution around the origin for the generating the, the, the hyperplanes that define this polytope. So these are very round polytopes. They, they are very special polytopes. Uh, there were similar analyses by Adler, Megiddo, Todd, Smale, where they look at a probabilistic model and they choose a constraint at random based on this probabilistic model. But again, the, the, the probability distribution is fixed. You're choosing from a specific probability distribution what the inequalities you're going to use. Okay, so again, I already mentioned the um, the random pivot rules for in the '90s. Kalai, uh, Smatushek, Sharir, Velsel, they they did a wonderful analysis of the expected number of iterations if you use the random pivot rule that I mentioned on the edges, right? So you pick that random edge to do that. And they show this in expect the, the expected number of pivots is actually sub exponential. It's a little bit milder than exponential because you have a logarithm. That's what I was trying to say before. Um, and so there was some hope that you know you will not find uh, bad examples that they will be always nicer. But it's not true. There are exponential examples even for this pivot rule. Okay, we know that now. And some of you have may have heard about the famous smooth analysis of smooth analysis of algorithms. So in uh, in the in uh, Spielman and Teng introduce um, this idea that instead of uh, evaluating an algorithm by the worst case, you're going to evaluate an algorithm by some kind of um, you don't do the average like before uh, where you look look at a specific fixed uh, subdivision. Um, but uh, the, uh, distribution, sorry, but you do the analysis with respect to the following idea. If somebody gives you an LP and you use a Gaussian noise, a Gaussian parameter noise, maybe uh, sigma to perturb the polytope. So you, your, per, your polytope is perturbed and then you look at what happens with the, re, with the perturbation. So the, the, the thing is that the diameter, so that, that means the shortest, the largest shortest path that you can have on the, poly, on the polyhedron after you do the perturbation is actually polynomial in the number of constraints and, uh, and, and one over, over sigma, where sigma is the parameter of perturbation, okay? So there are, there are many improvements of this result. The most recent one by Daniel Dadouche and, and Sophie Uverts in 2017, uh, but th this, this, this is a very nice result because they give you polynomial time, expected polynomial time behavior of the algorithms. Uh, let me mention just one more actually because I don't want to run out of time uh, to tell you my, my theorems. Um, the, the shadow vertex pivot rule actually was proved that it, 
um, again, in expectation, not this is a stochastic result. This is not deterministic. And I would like to show you our deterministic results. Um, if you measure, if you don't use a perturbation, you don't use noise, but you have a measure of the how flat the polytope is. Mm -hmm. So in, in, in computer science, we often measure the complexity of the polytope by looking at the largest subdeterminant on the matrix. Right? That's a very nice measure of the complexity of the polyhedron. And, uh, and if you do that, you can actually uh, call, we can use a parameter delta, which is essentially, is essentially the, the largest of the term, the subdeterminant. And, uh, and this, then you get expected number of iterations of the simplex method that is bounded by MD and one over delta. And I want to say this, this is an important comment because uh, Sugata already mentioned this question that um, all these problems, because this is stochastic, everything is non-degenerate, right? There's no degeneracy here. They don't appear because polytopes, you know, for, for uh, people in applications, when you do perturbations, there's no degeneracy, right? They go away. But if you want to know the diameter of a degenerate polytope, like a zero one polytope, I mean, that's, that's a tough one. Like a traveling Sesman polytope, what's the di diameter of a polytope like that? That's a different, diff completely different story, right? Okay. Okay, are there any questions about the previous part before I move on actually? Yeah, I, I want to get to, to our results and... Um, okay, so some positive, some positive news that are deterministic. So one of the main results, in my opinion, on deterministic uh, people rules that are positive and give you good, good behavior is um, Jim Orlin in 1997, he proved that if you have a, a network simplex algorithm, he constructed a, a very clever uh, people rule. Very, very clever, but I'm not gonna <laughs> have time to explain it. Uh, yeah, so he constructed a pivot rule that is guaranteed to, to fin finish in a number of steps that is polynomial in the input size. So the, he, I mean, he, he kind of settled this question for the network, si network simplex algorithm, right? But again, these are special types of LPs. I mean, not all, not all LPs are linear, totally unimodular. And this is, this is the case here, okay? Uh, now, we recently proved, and I want to show you this result because it's related to the shadow vertex results. It will help you understand shadow vertex even better than before, uh, is the fact that if you have a zero one polytope, we can, we can actually prove that the two, three, three very famous people rules behave very nicely. And I will explain to you what they are. Uh, at least two, I will explain two of them. Uh, by the way, zero one polytopes, if you do optimization, especially if you do integer programming, discrete optimization, mixed integer optimization, that, that's very important. I mean, uh, um, because zero one polytopes appear everywhere in optimization, I mean, traveling Sesman polytope, the Birkhoff polytope, et cetera. I mean, these are important uh, in applications. So I think understanding the, the behavior of the simplex algorithm on zero one polytopes is fundamental. And we try to give you some good results. I am very proud of this paper. Actually, uh, it just it was posted in 2020, 2022, finally, actually. I don't think it, we posted in 2021. Uh, anyway, uh, it's, it's under review right now. Uh, so the first part of the theorem is if you are given a polytope that is zero one, so you already know you, you're given a, a linear program that has uh, some representation, uh, that, but you know that the polytope has zero one vertices, okay? And I'm using, N for the number of variables of your in a system of inequalities and D for the, for the dimension of the polytope. Remember that the dimension of the polytope may be much smaller than the, the number of variables you're using to represent it. Like in the Birkhoff polytope, you need, uh, you, you can use N square variables, but you only need N minus one square variables, right? So that's uh, an example. Okay, so the theorem, the first part of the theorem is that in fact, the steepest edge people rule takes at most a polynomial number of non-degenerate steps. So this again goes back to the question of by Sugata. I mean, Sugata asked the question, what's going on with degenerate steps? Why is there cycling and all these things? So, so what we're saying is that the number of steps that actually improve, that you actually see the objective function grow is polynomial in the, in the uh, yeah, it's polynomial. It's a complicated polynomial, so I'm not gonna put it there, uh, but, is polynomial and, and that's using the steepest edge, the famous steepest edge that is the one that people use in practice, okay? 
Uh, but that again, we are not ruling the possibility that you need, you have some kind of uh, iterations that you start you spend. Oh, I'm just boring here, you know, bored in the same vertex. You need to get rid of, of that. Those I don't know how many you, of those you have. We don't have a, a way to control the degenerate iterations. Okay. Now, even better, we we, we did a variation of this of the shadow vertex pivot rule where uh, you take no more than the variable in many, so the number of variables many non-digit steps to reach the optimal, okay? And then finally, we have an even better version of the shallow vertex pure rule that only you only need dimension many iterations that are non-degenerate to get to the optimal, okay? Are you with me with the statement of the theorem? This is our first result. Uh, I want to mention. Okay, so what's the slim? So as Steve said, I already explained, you know, you of all the edges, you pick the one that gives you um, gives you the most improvement, but divided by the by the length of the edge, right? So you consider the length, it's a, it's a, you consider the ratio of improvement by the by the length. If you you know, have a very long edge that's going to give you a lot of improvement. That's not as interesting as a small edge that gives you a lot, of, a lot of improvement, maybe. Okay. Okay. So, the the slim shadow vertex pure rule is defined as follows: You start at the vertex, so you always need to have a have a starting vertex to define this pure rule. So you you start at some vertex x zero, uh, and and I don't want to go into the details, but you can always find such a vertex in the phase one of the simplex method. So there's one way to you know you run the simplex method in a special way the first time, and you get a vertex to start all the iterations, right? And um, yeah, so you need to so remember in, when you do shadow vertex pure rule, you need to have two objective functions. So I need to tell you how to get the second objective function because I already have the objective function C transpose, right? And um, the way I constructed is essentially by considering the, the, the non-zero entries, the number of, I guess, the, no, the number of non-zero entries in the, in, the, in the point that I'm standing. Because remember, the vertices are zero, one. These are, this, so this is gonna tell me, this is some kind of count of how many, how many entries are non-zero in the, in the in the in the in the vertex that you're currently standing, right? So now here is the idea. So just like in the shadow vertex, you have a projection, right? You have this projection given by C transpose and B transpose. So that's a projection that you're you're going to use. And again, the, what's the criterion of which edge to choose? So of all the possible neighbors, so you have a bunch of neighbors going out, and some of them disappear under the the shadow projection. But of the ones that, the, you know, you, you have these improving edges, you choose the one that, that maximizes this ratio, the ratio of the evaluating the edge with respect to the first object, the objective function C transpose divided by the objective, second objective function B transpose, okay? So you're following the path. I mean, essentially, you, again, you're following, it's the same idea. You're following the shadow path of, the, of, the, of that projection, but the, you, I, mean, I, need, I needed to tell you how to actually select the, the, the edge on top, not, not on the shadow, but on top, on the original polygon. Are you with me so far? So that's the, that's the explanation. Um, here's an example with a zero one cube. You know, this is a zero one cube. And I'm assuming that my original vertex is zero, zero, zero. So in that case, when you when you start at zero, 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 which you can assume in most cases, then the objective function I can tell you is literally just counting counting uh, counting non-zero non entries, right? And um, and this is a, for me, my example. I need to use this objective function because that, that's the projection. So you, right here you see the shadow, right? The shadow is going to be this hexagon here. And uh, so, okay, so I need to choose the edges according with this criteria, but the shadow again has to, has to be the, you know, you follow the shadow, but you might be saying, what's, what's so special about this objective function choices? The, the, what is special about this objective function choices is that you actually divide everything into very few slices. You see the projection of the polytope, the, the shadow of the polytope has very few slices. How many slices? Well, no more than dimension many in some sense. If you pick the right objective function, you're gonna, you're gonna have no more than number of variables many. And if you pick the, 
the more complicated version, you will have dimension many. So this is the, the definition of the um, slim shadow vertex pivot rule. Um, I mentioned the order shadow pivot rule. That's more complicated, but allows you to, the number of slices you're going to have is dimension, number of the, uh, the dimension of the polytope itself. And uh, if, you, if you know something about the, the diameter of polyhedra, the, the, the shortest diameter of the graph of a zero one polytope is actually the, the dimension of the polytope. That's, uh, so in some sense, the, the pivot rule we found the, uh, is the best possible that you can ever find because it really matches the diameter of the graph of the polytope. Are you with me? Any questions about these results? Okay, so let me tell you the second type of results that we have. And these have to do with classifying, classifying the, the, the pivot rules. Because if we are going to understand pivot rules, and so in the last 20, I have a, a, bit, a bit less than 20 minutes, but I will tell you how we classify pivot rules and how they have the structure of a polytope. Okay, so that's my plan. So let me skip a little bit. Yeah, so, so first of all, some people, some of you, uh, that you, if you like computer science, you might be thinking, well, Jesus, couldn't you study pivot rules as some kind of um, oracle or some kind of uh, algorithms? Or what, what's, what's the right way to think about it? Is this a Boolean circuit? Where, what kind of objects are, are pivot rules? So, you know, the pivot rules are complicated decision problems, right? You have to decide where to go. And to convince you that pivot rules are, this, are very difficult decision problems in computer science, let me show, show you this very interesting fact. You can encode MP complete problems by pivot rules. So for example, in, in, the, in 2000, around 2000, um, several people, Adler, Papadimitriou, Rubinstein, and then later this Dicer, Scutella, and then Fermi and Savani, they, they show that the following decision problem is MP, MP complete. You give me an L, a linear program, you give me a linear program, and then you tell me a vertex of the linear program. And then you ask me, is, my, is, the, is the simplex method gonna pass uh, through, this, through this vertex in the path? And deciding this MP hard in general for, for many people rules, for many people rules. For example, dancing people rule, this is an MP hard problem. So you gotta be careful when you deal with pivot rules because pivot rules can be encoding some very, some very sophisticated information. I mean, for example, shadow vertex pivot rule deciding the same question is, can be done in polynomial time actually. So yeah, one has to be a little bit careful of, uh, of what, how you try to, to define pivot rules by an algorithmic procedure. So our approach for classifying all pivot rules is going to be to use the geometry of the pivot rules. I'm gonna use the geometry of the pivot rules. Okay? So, so we are, we, I'm gonna just look at the pivot rules and, as geometric objects. As, what is the most essential information in geometric terms that a pivot rule can give you on a polytope? Okay, so I will define a geometric object. And that is, I already told you that when you have a, a linear program, you have an orientation that comes from oriented the edges of the, of the polytope, right? So the, the, I get this directed, sub, directed subgraph, a directed graph, and I'm going, I will consider for every monotone path, every possible, op, every possible monotone path produced by the simplex method, when you run that pivot rule, I will take the union of those paths, and that gives me a subgraph, a directed subgraph of the, of the, of the original subgraph. Okay, so that's the definition of the footprint. It's a geometric object. It's a subgraph of the original graph of the polytope when, after, with an orientation, okay? Now, this is very natural. I mean, you, you, might, you might say, well, how do, how do the footprints look like? Well, I will look at special types of footprints. The most important footprints that I would like to study are the when, when the, the footprint is a spanning tree, when, the, when, the, pivot, when the, the pivot rule defines an arborescence. So that's a directed spanning tree that the root of the spanning tree is the optimal solution of this polyp of this uh, objective function, okay? And uh, yeah, so 
that's the most economic footprint, right? When you don't have cycles. And, and you might be then question, questioning, well, what happens with, the, with these uh, pivot rules with, when you have different, different starting points, right? Because you remember, you have all these monotone paths that you produce by studying at any possible vertex and you just go to the same optimal solution. Yeah, so you're gonna have some kind of paths going to the optimal and they might cross, right? They might cross, so you, you get these complicated graphs. Yeah, so another way to think about memoryless pure rule is that at every given vertex, you know, there's a unique choice to get out of that vertex, right? You, you really have a unique outgoing, uh, outgoing arc that you choose that way. <clears throat> That's why you have a spanning tree in some sense. Now, there's many examples of memoryless pure rule, greatest improvement, steepest edge, they're memoryless. They're gonna give you spanning tree. They're gonna give you these this arborescences. Now, um, examples of things that are not, that are not memoryless are Sade's pure rule that has uses the history. Uh, shadow vertex is not memoryless because unfortunately, what can happen in, in shadow vertex, I mean, I, I don't have too much time to show you, but uh, in, in shadow vertex, you can have an initial vertex one, you go to the optimal, and then you have another initial vertex one, and then you go to the optimal, but you pass here and you don't have, I mean, it's like you took a different decision because a different projection. You see, the projection depends on where you start. The projection is, uh, depends on where you start. I, 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 don't, I don't know if I was clear enough with that, but the, the shadow, you really, the selection of the second objective function requires that you have some idea of where the vertex, initial vertex is, right? So yeah, so the shadow vertex is not memoryless. In fact, I mean, a random, random vertex, random pivot is not memoryless either because you, you again can have because you're, you, you, you are, you might repeat some different path uh, when you do it at random from a different starting point, right? You're running a process at random. Are you with me so far? But um, yeah, so I will, I only have 10 minutes. So let me just come to the punchline. So memoryless pure rules, they look like arborescences, right? And, um, and that's, that, that's very powerful for the following reason. And, and this, I want to argue why this is super interesting to understand pivot rules. Let me try to emphasize this, this important point. When you have a pivot rule that is not memoryless, you have uh, some, some spanning graph, directed spanning graph that may have some cycles, et cetera, right? But you can always compute the shortest path tree inside that footprint. So the footprint is not a, it's not a tree, it's not a spanning tree, but you can compute a, a short spanning, shortest path span, spanning tree on it. And in some sense, that shows you that inside every, every, every pivot rule, there is a, there is a, a, a memoryless pivot rule that is shorter, right? That you're go you're gonna have shorter paths inside there, right? And um, so that's why it's so exciting to try to classify all memoryless pivot rules because they, in some sense, if there is exponentially long paths for every memoryless pivot rule, then you know that all these exponential paths can exist. Uh, uh, you know, even bigger, even bigger paths will be in the in the other in the other monotone paths, other pivot rules. Sorry, are you with me? Okay, so, so far I have told you, these are all pivot rules, you know, all pivot rules. Then there are these memoryless pivot rules. And then inside the memory list, I want to show that there's something that is a special kind uh, of, of pivot rules, which I will call normalized weight pivot rules. And to define them, I just need two ingredients. I need, well, I need the polytope, the objective function, and then I need, uh, Another objective function called, I'm gonna call the weight, and I will need a normalization. So think of this normalization as a, as a norm. It's really, you can think of this as an L2 norm or an LP norm or something, right? So how do you choose the neighbor in these pivot rules? You choose the neighbor by, you look at all the edges that go out, right? You have all the edges that go out at the improve, the improving edges. Now the normalization, you can think of this as a norm. So you normalize, you're normalizing the, normalizing the length of the edges to some length. And that's what you, what you have the, there. And then the other objective function W allows you to, to sort them up. So you sort them up by, 
by that value. So it's a combination of shadow vertex, but you have, uh, you know, you have an extra norm here. And what is really amazing is that these NW rules, well, I mean, they, they are memoryless. I mean, they, they, they are going to be, um, they're going to be memoryless. For example, greatest improvement is an example when you pick W equals to the, to the objective function C itself, and the normalization is just, there's no normalization, it's just the, the constant number one. The steepest edge is exactly a special case when you take the LP norm, for example. Uh, there's one special family that we really like is that is memoryless as well. It's called the max slope. And that one is when you pick the normalization to be also the objective function itself. So, you, you are, so this one is really a generalization of shadow vertex because in that case, you are dividing two objective functions, right? You don't have a norm anymore in the, in the denominator, but you have some kind of, uh, you have the, this C transpose. So it's a generalization of the shadow vertex pivot rule. Okay. Um, yeah. So the bad news is that not all memoryless, not all memoryless pure rules are are not uh, normalized way pure rules. When you give me a polytope that is degenerate, I mean that there's not generic. So that's the bad news. I'm showing you an example here where uh, that that doesn't happen. But uh, let me just go to the punchline because I'm running out of time and I don't want to do that. When you have a polytope that has that it has a perturbation, you just randomly perturb the polytope. The, and it happens that when you do the perturbation, all the edge directions of the polytope are distinct. And that can be done just by random perturbation of the constraints. Then, um, then memoryless is equal to the NW rule. So the, these two concepts coincide when, when, the, when the edge directions are, are different. And the, the, in the realization spaces, you know, if you look at some algebraic realization spaces of polytopes, you can always realize this, uh, this, this for, for sure in the case of, of um, non-degenerated polytopes, for example, the cubes or for sure. So this, this is something you can actually do. So if, you, if somebody gives you an LP, my first reaction is let's perturb the LP, but let's perturb it in such a way that you know that the edges are different. And now we are, do the analysis of the pivot rules of this LP. That's the best way to do it because then all the memoryless pivot rules are, are NW rules. And then you can parameterize them. So in that case, uh, you can parameterize by just three parameters, by just three, three vectors, right? Essentially C, W, and, and, and the normalization eta. So, so your, your space of all pivot rules, so all the memoryless pivot rules, which are the most important pivot rules, has become a three dimensional, essentially a, a, a three, three parameter space. So this is a algebraic set of some kind, okay? And I would love to understand this algebraic set. And what we do is essentially, uh, let me go to the punchline because uh, I want to state the theorem. For example, what happens when you change, change just the weight? W. So what types of pivot rules, what type of memoryless pivot rules am I gonna get? How many different pivot rules am I gonna get? I mean, we, we know that when we have a polytope, the, every polytope has the, the so-called normal cones. If you are looking at the vertices and you want to know what are the objective functions that give me these vertexes to be the optimal, they all those are in this, the, all the, the objective functions that, that give you this objective function, this vertex to be the optimal, are in, the, in, a, in, a, in a polyhedral cone. Well, the same happens for, for the weights. If you, if you give me, you change the weight and you wanna know which, how many different weights give you the same, the same arborescence, give you the same pivot rule, the same memorless pivot rule, that's a, that's a polyhedral cone, that's actually, and if you put that all together, that gives you a polytope. So I'm gonna just state the theorem here. Yeah, so essentially there is a polytope that counts, there's an bijection to the possible arborescences. The, the vertices of this polytope are in bijection to the possible arborescences. All the possible memoryless pure rules that you can have as you change W, right? As you change W. And that's the pivot rule polytope that we call that the people rule, rule polytope, okay? So, so that construction 
I don't have too much time to explain the construction is not very different from the construction from the from the um, paper of Bilera, Kapranov, and Sulfels. It's a Minkowski sum of some some slices. So we we use similar ideas back go back going back to the nineties to classify this object, which is very beautiful to me. I mean, I I, I was a graduate student when I I was very happy to use this knowledge again. And uh, yeah, so we can classify pivot rules, that's the message. And the, the, the classification of different pivot rules, two pivot rules are the same if they give me the same spanning tree, the same arborescence, right? All right, so I want to end, uh, um, yeah. So we can do this in, in many different ways, uh, but uh, let me just say that, uh, for example, what's the pivot rule, what, what's the, if you have greatest improvement, as you change W, you get, and you apply this to a cube, you get a permutahedron. So you recover some of the classical polytopes. All right, so I, I'm running out of time and I see Sugata is leaving now. So let me just conclude with uh, some open questions and things like that. Um, yeah, so I have presented to you uh, that we can classify all the memoryless pure rules, but I hope you understand that memoryless pure rules are the most important ones to answer the question in linear programming, right? So because if you have memoryless pure rule are exponential, then all of them are exponential. And then, so we have shown you that they are parameterized by a, param by a per some uh, polyhedron. So there's a polyhedron that classifies them. And, and this is a algebraic set that we would like to understand. So thank you very much for all your uh, patience and uh, yeah, the papers are in the archive actually. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, Jesus, I really need to run, but yeah, I have fine. one quick question. Which, uh, is there any connection with secondary polytopes and, and this? Yeah, so it turns out that the, the, so the monotone path polytopes, so for example, we recommend the sosahedron Yes, so th these are fiber polytopes the way that Biller and Sturfeld said. Yes, so the, the answer is yes. These are, they have them as Minkowski sums. There are secondary polytopes inside, fiber polytopes inside, yes. Okay, I really need to run to- Yeah, I'll see you later. <laughs> Great talk, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, and also have to leave. Yeah, it's good to see you, Andre. Thank you, thank you, bye. Bye. Any other question? So I, I actually have one question. And uh, so, um, so, uh, so if you look at the iteration complexity, uh, do we have uh, any role of condition numbers of the problem? Because uh, I was always wondering if we have a, a ill post LP and give the simplex algorithm to solve the problem where exactly the condition numbers of the problem appear in the complexity. Yeah, I mean, I, I haven't looked at these constructions in terms of the condition number, but I know that uh, when I mentioned the work of the douche and all these people, the condition numbers are very important actually. So, so in some sense, in, in interior point methods, people have looked at the, the condition number is an important number. <laughs> And this, it hasn't been as important for the simplex method, but but it is. So nowadays, people I think are starting to realize that condition numbers should be part of the description somehow, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I have seen a few papers. For example, there are papers by Dadouche that consider the condition number. You should look at that. I can send you some re references if you are interested. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah. So, so you're gonna be in CMU, Ali? Yeah, I'm actually will be leaving in a few weeks. <laughs> oh wow! Right after the semester. Uh huh. So, are you? Uh, so, 